the index of a fraction, we call this n is equal to c divided by v. Remember, this is the speed of light in a vacuum. I will think of air being very similar to a vacuum. The speed of light in a vacuum and the speed of light just through the atmosphere is very, very similar. They're just off by a very small amount. And then this is the speed of light, say, for example, in glass or water. And we did an, a calculation last time, which you might have to do, where I say, for example, the index of refraction in glass is 1.5. Uh, what is the speed of light in glass? Well, in order to do that, we would take this and solve for the speed of light, which is going to be C divided by N, uh, which is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 1.5. 1 1.5 1 divided, or 3 divided by 1.5 is 2. And then you have your 10 to the 8th meters per second. Uh, just quick little algebra here. The way we get that. Well, you can think of it in a couple different ways. You could cross multiply here, so we get n times v equals c, and then divide both sides by n. And then those cancel out. And you get this expression, v equals c divided by n. You should be able to do that level of algebra for the, the test coming up in a couple weeks. Now, one of the results of this is that when light enters a medium at an angle, say, for example, if it's, if it's looking, or if it's going from... Um, air to glass, it's going to bend. And in this case, when it goes from air to glass, that is when it goes from an index where n is equal to 1 to a higher index where n is equal to 1.5, it's going to travel more slowly on this side. And so we can think of uh, the ray, right now we're drawing it as a ray, but we can also think of this in terms of wave fronts. Remember, wave fronts, we would draw the wave like this. So it's like these lines represent successive peaks in the waves. I don't just have a single ray of light. I actually have a whole front of light that's coming onto this surface. Now, if you're looking at, say, like a laser beam or whatever, you might say, well, gosh, that looks a lot like a ray. But really, if we were to expand it, it actually is uh, a front of waves. So this is the difference between our ray model of light and our wave front model of light, whatever we talked about last time. And we'll use both here. Uh, so when we look at this, this side of the wave, when it hits the glass, is going to travel faster or slower than it was traveling before. When, when the wave goes from here to here, it's going to travel what, faster or slower? It's going to travel more slowly. So when this part of the wave hits the medium, it's going to be traveling more slowly than this part of the wave. right? And so it'll turn one direction or the other. Have you ever uh, ridden in like a twin propeller boat? No? Have you ever driven a bulldozer? Or any kind of track type thing you have? You have? Great. So how do you turn a bulldozer? Or how do you turn a twin propeller boat? Well, yeah, you can make them go in opposite directions, or you can just make one of the tracks go faster than the other. So same with a twin propeller boat. I have two propellers on the back of my boat. If I want to turn this direction, which one do I make go faster, this one or this one? If I want to turn, I'm going to make this one go faster, because when this one goes faster, it shifts the boat in that direction. Similarly with a bulldozer, uh, forgetting the fact that you can make them go in reverse, because you can't make light go in reverse. But if I make this track go faster, then it's going to turn in this direction. Okay? So in this case, what direction is this light wave going to turn? Is it going to move towards the dashed line, or is it going to move away from the dashed line? It's going to move towards the dashed line. The dashed line, by the way, we call the normal line. Hey, Jocelyn. Uh, we call this the normal line, and we'll measure all of our angles from that line. So for example, we'll call this angle up here theta 1, and then we'll say that the light moves towards the normal line, and we'll call this angle theta 2. So in this case, when it moves from air to glass, the light moves towards the normal. Do you know what normal means, by the way? 
it's not like usual or this is typical in a mathematical sense. Normal means not everybody at once. It means 90 degrees, right? Y'all heard that word or that explanation? So normal, that's why it's called a normal line because it's at an angle of 90 degrees. So here, normal, this just means 90 degrees. It's a word that we use to mean that it's 90 degrees to the surface. In this case, the surface between the air and the glass. Now, last time we left off, we talked about the marching band and how I played tuba and somebody played the flute and somebody played the, I forget, what was the other thing? Oh, color guard, the color guard. Now, in a marching band, you want your whole marching band to go the same speed. And so usually we talk about this in terms of a marching band analogy, where you have this marching band that comes along, and it's moving from asphalt to a muddy field. And when a marching band enters a muddy field, what does it do? It, it slows down because you're mucking through the mud, okay? And so this marching band, if you want to think about it in terms of a marching band, I think the twin propeller boat or the bulldozer or any of those are fine. Uh, you can think about it as a marching band. When this side slows down and then this slide uh, speeds up and the whole thing turns as a unit. All right? Now, if we're moving from, say, uh, glass to air, you can probably imagine what's going to happen. So let's say I'm moving from glass to air. All right. Um, what is it going to do? Is it going to let's do it as a uh, clicker question? Is it going to move towards the normal? Or will it move away from the normal? Is it going to move towards or away from the normal? All right, about five more seconds. Stop at 22, 22. Awesome, it's going to move away from the normal because when it goes from glass to air, I think of my wave fronts traveling along here. When it enters the air right here, this side will travel faster. And this side travels more slowly, so it's going to cause this ray to move in this direction. You can really only have two, right? You can be moving from a high index to a low index or a low index to a high index. When I'm moving to a low index, that means my speed is faster. When I'm moving to a high index, that means my speed is slower. Let's try a different question. This is a, just a slightly different variation, but we'll do it as a clicker question. Let's say, for example, I have a situation like this. This is my interface between the two surfaces. I'm not going to tell you what the two surfaces are. Uh, I'll just call this number one, and we'll call this number two. And my light ray travels like this. In which of these is the speed of light the greatest? Is it A, number one, or B, number two? In which one is light traveling at the greatest speed? At surface number one, or material number one, or material number two? In which is light traveling at the greatest speed? All right, I'll stop at uh, 32, 32. Okay, good. Uh, 
That is right. Okay. I got print. There we go. That's right. A is correct. If you think about your wave model, I always have to go through the whole wave front analogy. I, I, you might memorize these, and that's okay if that's what you do, but you know, you only got so much space up there, as they say. I'm not sure that's true. That's not a proper view of the mind, but who wants to memorize stuff, right? Better understand it. All right, so if we have our wave front, this side is going to slow down, and this slide is going to speed up. So uh, that means that I travel faster here and I travel slower here. So the right answer is A, number one. Okay, you'll see some questions like that on the test, and we'll do some more in, the, in some more quicker questions. But make sure that you understand how right behaves when it goes from one medium to another. Um, you ever go spear fishing or bow fishing or anything like that? You ever shoot at anything in the water at all? No? Okay, I don't either usually. Uh, but if you think about how people do this when they go spear fishing, they have a spear and they want to get a fish. Well let's say that they see a fish that is right here. Now, you have to remember that they don't actually see the fish, right? They're actually seeing an image of the fish. So if this is the image of the fish, where should they shoot? Should they shoot above the fish or below the fish? That is, where is the actual fish? If they see the fish there, where is the actual fish? Is it A, above the image? Or is it B, below the image. Let's try it. This is a little more difficult question. Let's try it out. It's not at the image. Like if he wants to shoot this fish with his spear, he doesn't aim at the actual image. He either has to aim above the image or a little bit below the image in order to actually strike the fish. Okay. So where is the actual fish? All right. So let's stop at uh, 35. 35. All right. Let's see. So if I have a light ray that comes off of this fish, um, actually, let's see. So... Let's imagine, y'all said it's below the fish. So let's say that this is the actual fish. All right? I have a light ray that comes up like this, right? And then it's going to bend. Is it going to bend towards or away from the normal? It's going from water to air. So it bends towards or away from the normal line? Away, right. So as my light ray comes up, it speeds up right here, and then it's going to travel to the person's eye. But this guy sees the fish as if it's right there. So B is correct. That's pretty good. Students don't usually get that right. I usually have to sort of go through the argument. Did y'all go through that argument about what happens to the right way? No? Okay. <laughs> that is the where the spear was going. Oh. That's interesting. Yeah, she's she's sort of right in the way that she approached that. She's not a, you're not exactly right, but that's a really great way to think about it, because the spear actually doesn't bend when it enters the uh, the water. It might bend a little bit, but it doesn't really bend that much. Not the way that light rays do. But yeah, that is a great way to think about it. That if you think about a light ray that originates at his eye, it travels down, and then it's going to bend towards the normal. That's really a great way to think about it. In fact, if you were fishing, say, with like a laser gun instead of a spear gun, then that's exactly how you would shoot. If you were fishing with a laser gun, you would aim at the image because it would bend when it enters the water. If you're fishing with a spear, I mean, you're wrong in that sense, but the spear doesn't really bend. But that is a great way of thinking about it. That's excellent. Okay. Did everybody else think of it in that way?
Okay. All right. Well, that's. Um, I want to show you something. You might have seen this before. A couple of things I want to show you. The first is. Um, you ever taken a pencil and put it in a glass of water? Like this, when you have a pencil in a glass of water. Or you may have seen pictures of this before. Because of the way that light bends, that pencil is going to to look bent. So uh, let's see. Let me just bring the card over here. Can't pass it around because you'll jostle the water too much. Let me turn on the big light. All right. So if you look at this pencil. If you look at the pencil closely, you'll see that there is a, a, a you'll sort of see, Tammy, can you see that from back there? You'll, I'll, I'll bring it down so y'all can see. But if you look at this pencil, you'll see, which way does it go, actually? And there is a disconnect between the image of the pencil that you see in the water and the actual pencil. So the red here is the actual pencil. And then here, in the bottom part where you have this disconnect, is an image of the pencil. And that's because you have this uh, this refraction of light at the surface between when the pencil is under the water. Can you all see that? Yeah? Let me move it down here so you all can see. So here you see the actual pencil. But when you look at the side of the, the image of the pencil, you get this disconnect from the actual pencil and the image of the pencil. A similar thing is with the fish. I want to show you one other thing. Uh, the pencil, you have the image of the pencil, which you see through the water, and then you have the actual pencil, which you see up here, and there's a disconnect. You can actually sort of see it a little bit better, I think, in this. I'm going to bring this down and show you all this in just a sec. I'll bring it down there. But this is uh, Wesson oil. And Wesson oil has an index of refraction that's very, very close to that of Pyrex. You know what Pyrex is, right? Like you have kitchen dishes made out of Pyrex usually. Pyrex is just glass, but it's heat treated so that you can put it in the oven. Because if you try to put, you know, any old thing in the oven, it's going to crack. Because it heats up too quickly and the glass, it heats up in different parts too quickly and it'll cause the glass to crack. Okay? Uh, so anyway, this is Pyrex, and it's a lot like glass, but it has an index of refraction that's very, very, very close to that of Wesson oil. So here I have two things in the Wesson oil. I have a glass rod, and then I also have another Pyrex dish down inside of there. Marissa, can you see the Pyrex dish? Yeah? But if you look closely, like you can see the numbers, and even you can see sort of the outlines, but it appears almost invisible. Can you see that? Y'all can sort of make out the Pyrex dish in there. Can you see back there? When I move it, yeah. It basically disappears inside of there. If I move it around because it has print on it, and you can sort of make out the lip of the dish. But you can definitely see the, the glass rod, right? It stands out because glass has an index of refraction that's quite different from Western oil. You see, usually when you have something that's inside of water, the reason that you can see it is because when light travels through it, it bends. And when it bends, then you can make out with your eye that actual image of the object inside the material. But when it has an index of refraction that's basically the same, then it doesn't bend and it appears invisible. So here, this is the glass rod. Here is the, the little Pyrex dish. You can see the print on it right there, and you can sort of make out the lip, but largely it's pretty much invisible. It has some orange stain down on the bottom, too. You can see that back there? Where I am? Is it you can see? Y'all can stop by and see later. It's actually pretty cool. I, mean, I, I think it's cool. I don't know if y'all think it's cool or not. Okay, so here, here's the glass rod. You can see it. It has an index that's quite different from Western oil. And then this is your Pyrex dish. It's a beaker. But you can do this with anything that's made out of Pyrex. Like I said, you can see the lip, but it basically becomes invisible inside the Western oil. Unlike uh, if I had Pyrex in water, you could see it pretty well. All right? All right. Let's look at when light moves from 
one material to another material and then back to that original material. Which we'll see with lenses pretty soon. So let's say that if I have a block of glass, and I'll show you this with an actual block of glass, glass or something with a high index of a fraction, and it sits in air on this side and in air on this side. Now remember, the index of a fraction for glass is 1.5. For air, it's equal to 1. You don't need to know the index for glass, but you do need to know that the index for air or for a vacuum is equal to 1. I won't give you that. I'll assume that you know that. Okay? The index for air or a vacuum is just equal to 1. All the other indices of a fraction I'll give you, glass is 1.5, water is 1.3. Those are really the only ones we'll see, but I'll give you those on the test coming up. When is the test? I don't know either. It's it's quite a way. Oh, it's on the final day. It's like May 7th or something. Right? All right. Um, so I'm moving from air to glass. Um, if I move in this direction, towards or away from the normal, you recall, it's going to move towards when I move from a low to high index. Right, think about your bulldozer or your marking man or whatever. Slows down here, speeds up over here, causing the whole thing to shift towards the normal. And then over here, I draw a new normal line. Moving from glass to air, I'm going to go away from the normal. Now, uh, let's see, I didn't draw that very well. Turns out, and I'll show you how this comes about in our equation, that this line and this line are parallel to one another. So they aren't in line with one another, but they're parallel to one another. So anytime I have a ray that enters into something like this, it's going to shift towards the normal and then away from the normal so that it's basically just shifted over in one direction. So it shifts a little bit in this direction. Look, I brought a piece of acrylic. This isn't glass, but it works much the same. I'm going to turn the light off. Turn it off for just a second, okay? Oh, let's see. So, if I have my light ray, you can see how it bends through. Oh, let's see. You can see how it bends through the, can you all see it inside the acrylic there? It sort of scatters a little bit light as it comes through here. So it bends towards the normal. And then you can see the uh, the spot over there on the wall. Watch what happens when I pull it out. They shift just a little bit. So see there it's up high on the wall, and then it's a little lower on the wall. They just shift just a little bit. So light travels. It bends at both interfaces. First it bends towards the normal, and then it bends away from the normal, just through a flat you know, a flat slab of glass or acrylic in this case. You should know how light travels through this. Also, we'll look at prisms. And you should know the path that light travels through a prism. Prisms are pretty important. We use them for a number of purposes, primarily for prism spectrometers. A spectrometer takes light and it splits it up into its different colors. You probably studied those, I don't know, wherever, chemistry or whatever. Uh, a prism looks like this. It's just a triangular piece of glass. If I have a light ray that comes in, it'll come in like this. It'll bend towards the normal. And then over here, it's going to bend away from the normal. So it causes light to bend in this way. Um, you could even have like a free response question on the next test where I just ask you to, to trace out the ray that, a, that a, uh, a light ray would take or the path that a light ray would take. I have a prism here. Prisms can come in different shapes. So this is a, what is this, a, a right equilateral triangle? I'll turn that back on in just a second. So my, let's see, my light ray, yeah, that's pretty good. It enters in one face right here where it comes in, and then it bends towards the normal. And then up here on the second face when it exits the glass, it bends uh, away from the normal, causing it to, to move in that fashion, okay? So, for example, on the test, I could give you just 
a blank prism, for example, with without this information, and just ask you to draw the rays as they travel through the prism. Similarly with a flat slab of glass. I could ask you that as well. Or I might give you a multiple choice question that has different paths and you have to you have to uh, select the one that's true. But have a general idea of how these light rays move through these simple pieces of, of glass. Oh, uh, let's see. Give me just a second. Okay, we're going. I want to show you a little video. A student of mine did this uh, a number of years ago where he, Chris Cortez, some of y'all might know him, he graduated a number of years ago. But he found that this whole idea of refraction also occurs on his lawnmower. And he actually found that it occurred in a similar. Well, let me just show you the video and then we'll talk about it. Um, all right. So um, the law of refraction, which is given in your book, you're not going to have to do any calculations with it, but you need to know how the equation works and know what happens when you change things in it. of refraction says this. It says that the index of refraction that N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. So, for example, if I'm going from N1 over here, let's say that N1 is equal to 1 and N2 is equal to 1.5, uh, that that's going to cause this to get smaller. This angle is theta 1, this angle is theta 2. This is like going from air to glass. And so we can see how this works in the equation where N2 gets bigger, so that means that theta 2 will get smaller. Don't worry about the sine thing. I know you probably don't work with sines very much. In fact, if you want to think about this equation instead of thinking about it in this way, this is not exactly correct to write it like, like this, but you can think of it as n1 theta 1 equals n2 theta 2. Or actually, to be more correct, we can just put a proportionality sign there. That they're not equal, but they're related to it in that way. So that if I increase n2, keeping these constant, then I have to decrease theta 2. Right, that's what happened over here. When n1 goes to 1.5, theta 1 gets smaller when it becomes theta 2. All right, so don't sweat the signs. I know some of you might sort of freak out about the signs. You can think of it as in terms of this relationship n1 theta 1 is proportional to n2 theta 2. Now, uh, imagine then that if I have light traveling from glass to air. I have light traveling from glass to air. What happens if I increase theta 1? So if theta 1 goes up, what happens to theta 2? Does theta 2 go up? Does theta 2 go down? Or does theta 2 remain the same? Let me repeat that again. What happens if I increase this angle? What will happen to the refracted angle of the light ray in air? If I increase theta 1, does theta 2 go up? Does theta 2 go down? Or does theta 2 remain the same? If I increase theta 1, what happens to theta 2? That means I make this bigger. I move it 
to a larger angle. What happens to theta 2? All right, you are almost evenly split between A and B. And it is either A or B, it's not C. It is either A or B. So what we're asking here, n the remaining constant, n1 and n2, those are constant. If theta1 goes up, what does theta2 do? If theta1 goes up, what does theta2 do? Does it go up or does it go down? All right, we'll stop in just a few seconds. I'll stop at 133. Okay, the answer is A here. Uh, that if theta 1 goes up, then theta 2 goes up as well. It's a linear relationship, okay? So if I do something to this side, the same thing has to happen to this side. Now I know what you're thinking. Before we said, well, if this goes up, this goes down. And that might be why y'all put down. I'm not sure what you were thinking. But here, when I'm talking about this, this isn't a, a direct relationship. It's an inverse relationship. So between these two, direct relationship between these two and inverse relationship. So if this one goes up, this one goes down. But here, if this one goes up, this one also goes up. So something funny is going to happen as I continue to increase theta 1. What happened to the lawnmower as he was traveling on the grass and the asphalt, like along the, the two cement tracks? What did he do as he traveled along the the cement tracks. What did he do in the lawnmower? He bounced, he was like, he's like drunk or something, right? In the lawnmower, he's weaving back and forth, right? So uh, what happens when you increase theta, two, theta 1 to a particular angle is that you get something called total internal reflection. I don't think this is in your book, but it's just a little bit, a little bit of a step away from away from, uh, you know, law of refraction. And that's important because you use this on things like, uh, uh, what's it called, an endoscope when they, well, not exactly, but like when you shine, when you have these fiber optic cables, you can shine lights through them and direct them into particular places inside the body. They use a concept called total internal reflection. All right? If you have glass to air, it always has to be, if we'll call this N1 and this 2, for our total internal reflection to occur, N1 must be bigger than N2. Right? Because if I continue to increase N1, eventually I'm going to get it so that that light ray never leaves the medium. And as I even continue to increase N1 even more, I'll get it so that it doesn't even do that. It just reflects back on itself. And this is called total internal reflection. It's a property of refraction, but it looks a lot like reflection. This is the idea behind fiber optic cables. You know, which we use now in Thibodeau, we use them to transmit data for our uh, our internets, they have fiber optic cables laid in most of Thibodeau and the surrounding area to transmit information. It's really nice to use that instead of, say, copper wires like they do for cable lines and phone lines and stuff uh, because you can just transmit a lot more information at a much faster rate through these fiber optic cables. They use pulses of light to transmit data, whereas before they would use electrical signals. And it's a much more efficient way of transmitting light, okay, of transmitting information. It also makes for a pretty decent magic trick. I'll show you now. All right, so you can do this at a dinner party. I'll show you uh, this video. This Australian guy did it because he's probably a lot cooler than me. But let me show it to you now. Cause it can y'all see the sheet of paper? You'll see it. You see it now? Yeah? Maria? 
Can you see the sheet? You can't really see it, can you? Okay. Um, so you all can see it there? So you're at a party and you have your glass and it's empty and you put something underneath your glass and then you come along and you fill the glass with water and watch what happens. Can you see the paper now? Ah, ah, still looking. Can you see it? No, you can't see it. The reason is, is that light travels up. You before it would just leave, right? It could leave. Um, let me draw a picture. Before, when we had the glass and it was empty, and we had a piece of paper or whatever, the light would travel and it would it would bend a little bit, but not very much. But then, when you fill the glass with water, the light ray travels, and then it bends back on itself like that. So you get, because you filled it with an index of refraction that's higher than the surrounding region, now I can look here and I see it just fine, but when you look from the side, you can't see it at all. It disappears. You want to see the Australian guy do it? Yeah, I look really excited today. Is it the rain or something like you like coming out on rainy days? That was a joke. Like you look miserable today. You look terrible. Okay, so um, let's move on to lenses. We're going to look at lenses. You'll need to know the different types of lenses, concave, convex lenses, and what they do to light. And then what we what they do in the eye, we have a particular lens we call a convex lens inside of the eye. And then also how we do corrective things on the eye. So we'll go through all those things. Um, it's fairly interesting. I think it's interesting. But let's look at... Um, refraction by a lens. There's a section in your book that's called Refraction by a Lens. Um, so we're looking particularly at the cornea. We will later in greater detail. But the cornea is a curved surface. Which acts as a lens. And in fact, if you know anything about the eye, which I think many of you have studied the eye, there actually is something called the lens inside of your eye. Now, both of those, the cornea and the lens, bend light, but the cornea is really primarily responsible for, for most of the bending of light that occurs in your eye. We'll talk about that later. So when we talk about lens in the eye, we'll talk both about the cornea and then the lens, which is behind the cornea. Uh, but the cornea does most of the actual refraction. Um, we have two types of lenses. And we're going to describe them in two different ways. We'll call them either converging or diverging. Uh, these words describe what they do to the light. So converging lenses cause light to converge on themselves. Cause light to converge. And diverging rays, as you might think, cause light to diverge. I'll draw you a picture a little bit later showing that. But uh, when I have converging lenses, they cause light rays to converge or come together. And if I have diverging lenses, they cause light to diverge or to go apart from one another. We also describe these lenses by their shape. And so we have two other words that we'll use to describe the lenses, which you may familiar be may be familiar with. Uh, a converging is also called a convex lens. And a diverging is called a concave lens. Always keep these separate in my mind because the concave surface looks like it's caving in. So a concave lens or a diverging lens looks like this, and a convex lens looks like this. Right. 
The converging lens, which is also called the convex lens, causes light rays to converge. So if I have light rays that come in, like this, parallel light rays, they will converge at a particular point. However, over here, these rays are going to be divergent, not like in the book or the movie, if you've seen that, but diverging in the sense that they move apart from one another. Y'all read that book, Divergent? No. The movie. Was the movie good? Yeah. Great. Hey, we saw uh, The Force Awakens two nights ago. Have y'all seen that? That was a great movie. It's the, star the new Star Wars movie. And I was really, I'm not a big Star Wars fan, but I was really impressed with the movie. I thought it was quite good. My son, on the other hand, loved it. All right, so also remember, it appears, to me anyway, I always think of this, that this side of the lens is caving in. And since it's caving in, then I think of that as a concave lens. All right, so two words, you need to know uh, what both of them mean, convex and concave refer to the geometry, the shape of the lens, and converging and diverging, they describe the same lenses, but it describes what the lens does to light, whether it causes light to converge or to diverge. Uh, these lenses are made up of spherical surfaces. May I go down? Uh, convex and concave lenses are spherical. Right, you can think of these made up of like squishing together two different spheres. Like for example, let's say that this is our let's say that this is our lens. Gosh, what is this lens called? Is this convex or concave? I always forget. It, oh, this is the convex, right? Because it's not the one that's caving in. That's a concave lens. Right, so this concave lens, you can think of this as having two sides of a sphere. So imagine, you see uh, this side right here? I can imagine that as a sphere that extends. Well, that's not a very good sphere. A sphere of which that little segment is just a small part. So this side of the lens is really part of a much larger sphere. And similarly, this side of the lens is part of a bigger sphere in the other direction. So this side of the lens is like part of a sphere in that direction. But really, the lens is this part that's in the middle. Right. Now, we can describe these lenses, too, by some quantities. The center of curvature. This is this point. It's called the center of curvature. We call this C. And similarly, over here, this is also the center of curvature, or C. So both sides have a center of curvature. It's just the center of that circle the center of the sphere, or the radius of the sphere. And then both of them also have something we call the focal point, which is what we use most commonly. This is called the focal point. Uh, we can use other words, like other, other uh, equal terms would be like focal length. We'll call this F. Uh, what's another? There's another term, I think. Maybe focus, I don't see that. But focal point and focal length and the letter F all refer to the same thing. There is kind of a distinction between focal point and focal length in that focal point is this particular point in space, and focal length is the distance from here to here. Let me draw that. So anytime we're measuring these distances, we always measure from the lens. So my focal length is the distance to the focal point. But I'll sort of use those interchangeably. We're never really interested with a point in space, but always the distance from the focal point to the actual lens. So that's a convex lens. In a similar way, if I draw a concave lens, you can imagine this is a concave lens. 
And I can think of this as being as part of two big spheres, too. Right? A sphere there and a sphere here. Uh, I have centers of curvature C, center of curvature C there, and then I also have focal points here and here. So the point is that for all these lenses, these concave and these convex lenses, I have a center of curvature and a, uh, a focal point or a focal length. Go with me on this, folks. All right, here's a, I have brought a convex lens. Actually, I brought, these are just some flat surfaces. Or excuse me, uh, just some pieces of glass or acrylic. This one, what is this shape called? This is convex, and this is concave. This is going to cause light rays to do what? Converge or diverge? Converge, and this will cause them to diverge. I can show you. Let me show you with the laser. I don't have two lasers, unfortunately. They're kind of difficult to get to go in line with one another, but you'll see... I shine it through that here, you know, the laser goes straight to the wall, but notice that if I put it through the lens, it goes down. So you can imagine that this light ray, if there were another light ray that were down here, they would cross at a point which would be the focal point. So this is a convex lens and it causes light rays to converge at a particular point. This is a concave lens because it's caving in. Here, you know, your light ray just goes straight ahead. Is the point of light going to be above where it is now or below where it is now when it goes through the lens? It's going to be above, right? Quite a bit above because it diverges from its original path and actually goes up. So this is a concave lens that causes light rays to diverge. Um, I brought an actual lens. I'll pass it around in just a bit or maybe next time. But this is a convex lens. Oh, I'm going to get it right one day. Sorry. I should have labeled them. With bring my Sharpie and write on that. Uh, this is a convex lens. I took this out of my wife's glasses. No. Uh, although she does have some pretty thick glasses. But they have now, you know, if you, if you have a really big, uh, really powerful lens, uh, which we measure is like the inverse of the focal length, they can, that lens would normally be really thick, but they can actually make them thinner now. Did y'all know that? Yeah. Because uh, they use a different kind of material or something. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but anyway, this is a convex lens. I don't have a concave lens. They're not that not as common. We notice it bulges out on the sides. A concave lens would be thinner in the middle than it is on the sides. We'll probably pass this around next time. All right. So those are our concave and convex lenses. Um... There are other types of lenses, such as plano concave. You need to be able to identify these just if I show you an image of a plano concave lens, know what it is or be able to identify it properly. So a plano concave is, con is planar on one side and concave on the other. That's like this one. This is a plano concave lens. It's planar on one side, plano, and it's uh, concave on the other end. Plano convex, which works, it's planar on one side, convex on the other side. This is a plano convex lens. It's flat on one side, convex on the other. Uh, there are a couple others. There is a concave convex, which is sometimes it looks like a meniscus lens. Don't worry about the meniscus lens, but it's a little bit different. A con cave convex. Actually, let me see what your book. Your book does something a little bit different, I think. Does anybody have their book? Let me borrow it for just a second. I don't want to tell you different from the book. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Travis. He's a little too fast. Um... Have y'all read the chapter yet? Okay, I need to pick out those old tests. Let's take a look at those. Yeah, let's see. Yep, 
You know what? Let's just know these. Let's just know our convex, concave, and then our plano concave, plano convex. Your book does talk about meniscus lenses. And if you go into some field where you're doing, you know, optical stuff, like with the eye, then you'll need to know those. But for now, we'll just sort of go with this. That plano concave, plano convex, and then, of course, the concave and the convex. Your book has some other discussion about meniscus concave and meniscus convex. Don't worry about that. Okay? All right. So just be able to identify the geometry of those. All right. Um, we can create some images. It will help you to be able to know how to draw the rays. So if I have a convex lens, particularly for the convex lens, know how to draw rays as they travel through a convex lens, because that's what we'll be looking at with the eye, uh, with a convex lens. If I have a ray, here's my focal point here and here. This is F and F. And I have a ray. Let's say I have an object over here. And I have a ray first that travels here. Where does it go when it's parallel to the axis, when it goes to the lens? Where does that ray go? It goes down. And through what point? Through the focal point. Right, that's how we define the focal point. The focal point is the point where rays will cross. So the focal point is not just half the center of curvature. It is also the point where parallel rays cross. Let me draw another little figure here. So here's my convex lens. If I have two rays that are going parallel to one another, they will cross at the focal point. That is my focal point. All right. But remember, where does an object have to be in order for rays from that object to be parallel? Does it have to be up close to the lens or far away from the lens? You recall from last time? How do we get light rays to be parallel when they're coming from the same object? We get that close to it, or we move far away from it? We move really, really far away from it. Like the sun, right? We're really far away from the sun. Light rays from the sun, it's as if they are moving parallel when they reach us. So my light rays will, uh, will focus at the focal point. Now, if I have something that's close, like this object right here, the light rays won't focus at the focal point because they're not parallel. So here, I draw a light ray that is parallel to the axis on this side and through the focal point on this side. I can also draw a ray that is through the focal point on this side and then parallel to the axis. So this other ray goes through the focal point and then parallel to the axis. Right. So my image now is where those rays cross. My image is going to be right here. This is my object. This is my image. Object over here. Image right here. Is this image uh, upright or inverted? Over here, this is like an arrow. This is my object. When it gets to the other side, it flips so that it becomes an inverted image. Um, let me show you right now. You can really see this pretty well. I'm going to pin this is my office lamp. I'm going to pass around a couple of lenses, one on one side and one on the other side. And what I want you to do is to take a sheet of paper like this, and you're going to project an image of that lamp onto the paper. So Play around with this. I'll, you'll take a minute or so, and then you'll see an image of the lamp on the paper. You should be able to see details. Like, you should be able to make out the general, anything that you can see over there, you should be able to see on the paper. I can make out sort of the general shape of the light bulb. Actually, I can see it better on the paper than I can over there. Uh, I can see the shape of the, you know, the, what's that called? Thing that comes up, the shade or whatever. You can see all those things uh, on the paper. And then I want you to recognize that the image that's on the paper is upside down from the image that you see on the lamp. Same thing happens with your eye. Did you know that? 
then the image that is projected onto your retina is upside down from everything else. That's why, let me not pass this around. Y'all go ahead and start making the images. Here I have a smaller lens. And you can notice when you get this, you can still make an image, but it'll create a different size image. Okay? Uh, it turns out to be a smaller image. That's not because the lens is smaller. It's because the focal length is different. So pass those around. They, when they meet in the middle, you can keep going because they make different size images. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So y'all get those catalogs, right, where they sell you, like, goofy science stuff? No. They sell these things, these glasses that you can buy, and they are a mirror, basically. They flip everything upside down. It just has, like, a prism and a mirror, and it takes everything and flips it upside down. And at first, it's a little disorienting, but after about 15 or 20 minutes of wearing it, your brain adjusts and flips everything right back up again. So it's like, you, it's like you're not even wearing the glasses. Because that's what your brain does anyway, is it takes the image, which is on your retina, and it flips it inside of your mind and allows you to process it as an actual image. All right? Y'all play around with that. You'll want to... Are you trying to get JC on there, Adele? You want to have the, the uh, lamp the lens and the mirror all in a line. Are y'all able to see the, the lamp on the sheet of paper? Did y'all see? Okay, let me let me give you a little guidance here. Because once you see it, it's really cool. Did y'all anybody over here see it? Okay, look. There's my mirror. I'll come back here. There's my uh not my mirror, my uh, lamp, thank you. And I have these all in a line like this. And then I move, I adjust oh, there it is. You see the little picture of the, the lamp? Right, they're all in a line, and then I have to adjust the lens to find the focus, just like you do with your camera. There. Paige? Alyssa. Paige. You got it? You can see it? All right, why don't you all try it again, because it's useful when you see it. You don't see real images that often. This is a real image. We have two types of images your book talks about. Real images. and virtual images. It's on your face, actually. <laughs> you have real images and virtual images. Uh, real images, you can project onto a screen. That's what you're making right now. You don't really see real images that often. They're just not that common. I mean, this is a real image, right? Because I can project it onto a screen. I have a screen. I project it onto a screen. Uh, what I have is I have a convex lens inside of the projector, and then behind that you have a source of light, and it projects that image onto the screen. Uh, you'll want to see the piece of paper, so you'll sort of need to hold it to the side of you so you can see where the image is. It's on your face, guys. Okay, there we go. Jacqueline, you'll want to be able to see the, the, the other side of the paper. Can I show you? Do you want to look at the front? Do you want to hold it like this? See? Yeah, there it is right there. All right, awesome. Notice it's upside down. That real image is inverted. In fact, real images are always inverted. Uh, virtual images you cannot project onto a screen. Make sure you know the difference between a real and a virtual image. Virtual images are like what you see in your bathroom mirror, right? Because you can't project that onto a screen. Everything lines up partly. You need to bring your paper over this direction. You need to be able to see the paper, too. <laughs> partly. <laughs> Let me show you. Oh, where is it? Oh, there it is. Can you, can you turn the lights off over there, Tarion? Thank you. The top button. The very top button. See, there we go. See it? What is this? You're next? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. You get a nicer one with this. 
Isn't that cool? Well, we should do the lamp more often in here. Isn't this nice? Okay, real images you can project onto a screen. Virtual images you cannot. What? Let me show you another type of image. It's sort of a real image. Sort of not, but it sort of is, too. You can do this with mirrors. I don't want to confuse y'all too much with the mirrors because they're a little bit different from lenses, but they are a lot the same, too. You ever have, like, a bathroom mirror, or like not a flat mirror, but, like, a shaving mirror or a makeup mirror or whatever? One of those mirrors, when you get up close, you're, like, really, your face, well, your face is, like, really big. All right, that's what this is. I mean, this is a little bit different, but can y'all see yourselves in this? Right. So just like, what's that? No, not this kind on a bus. You have a different kind of mirror on a bus like you have on a security mirror. This wouldn't be a very good bus mirror because all the kids would be upside down and your bus driver would get really confused. right? And also, uh, y'all do look smaller in this. But anyway, that's, called a that's a different kind of mirror. So this is a converging mirror. And it's producing an up, an inverted but real image, uh, just like you see with the lens. All right, um, you can put two of these together. So I just have two of these, and they interact in such a way to produce a real image. I have a pig. This is a little pig. You can see it. I'll put it down in the bottom. You can pass it around and hold it like this. You, know, you can look like this, and you'll see the pig. But if you hold it like this, you'll be able to see an image of the pig. This isn't exactly a real image, but it's sort of a real image. I can sort of see it right there. Okay, it's a uh, like a hologram of sorts. All right, so let's pass this around. Okay, these real images and virtual images. We'll get into this a little bit later, but convex lenses. can either create real or virtual. Convex lenses can either create real or virtual images. Like the one that you're doing now is a real image, where you have the object here, you have the image here, object, image. A virtual image. Um, I'll pass it around in just a bit, but a virtual image occurs when you have the object here and the image uh, is actually here. So this is my object and this is my image. Don't sweat that too much about where the image is. Just think of the image for a convex lens is going to be upright and uh, bigger. What use, when I produce an image that is bigger and upright, what use is that of a convex Vex lens that we use it for commonly. Y'all know? Use it to kill ants sometimes, maybe. A magnifying glass. So that is a magnifying glass. Uh, is, has everybody seen the lenses? Yeah? Can I, I'll take it back then. So a magnifying glass, use this when you're, you can look at something and make it bigger. It depends upon where your object is. So if your object is far away from the lens, it will make an, uh, a real image. If your object is up close to the lens, it makes a virtual image. All right. So convex lenses can create real. That's when the object is far away. Or it can make virtual images when the object is close. Actually, when I say far away, what I mean is outside of the focal point. And when I say close, what I mean is inside of the focal point. You know, and the focal point of the lens on our eye is about a centimeter or a little less, maybe a half a centimeter. 
That's part of the reason why we can't see things when they're up close to our eye. Right? Put your finger up next to your eye. It just looks really fuzzy. You can't, you physically can't see things when they're up close to your eye. In fact, we'll see later that there is actually a near point to your eye where you begin to not be able to see things at all, and that's slightly different. But uh, when I have an object that's inside the focal point, that creates a virtual image, and a virtual image your mind can't process because it doesn't project onto your retina, and it doesn't give that electrical signal to your brain. Right, just a couple more minutes, we'll wrap up, okay? Um, Listen, we are going to skip the lens maker's equation. You can skip that for your quiz, too. We're going to skip the lens maker's equation. You might see this if you go into some optometry field, uh, but it describes how to get lenses of particular focal lengths, but it's not really important for what we'll need to do later. So you can skip that whole section in your book. And then we'll pick up with, uh, where are we, with the power of a lens. You might have heard doctors talk about the power of your glasses, for example, or the, the prescription. Are you, you guys wear glasses, some of you? They talk about the power of your prescription. The power of a lens, P is just equal to the inverse of the focal length, right? So, for example, if your focal length is, uh, if your focal length is small, that means that the power goes up. So, let's look at two lenses. Let's say that I have a lens like this, and then I have a lens like this. Which of these lenses has the smaller focal point? The one on the top or the one on the bottom? Let's try it as a clicker question. Which one has the smaller focal point? The one on the top or the one on the bottom? Can I turn the, uh, has everybody done the lens already? Do I have my big lens? Oh, you have it, Marissa. It's tripping, is that what you said? Let's get trippy. Y'all done, Marissa. Thank you. I'm going to turn the lights back on. Hopefully, I'll get the right one. Ah. Okay. Which one has the smaller focal point, A or B? Remember, a focal point is half the center of curvature, and the center of curvature is, is the center of that sphere out of which that lens was cut. So, well, that's better. Okay. So, I will stop at... Uh, 55, 55. Well, that's not better. Let me show you. I'm going to show you a picture. So, this lens was cut out of a sphere that looked like this or like this. This lens, on the other hand, was cut out of a, a bigger sphere like that. So, which of these, A or B, have the smaller focal point? Okay, that's good. I'm going to stop at 125. Okay, good. B is right. Uh, it has the smaller focal point. Lenses that are really fat in the middle, they have shorter focal points because they're cut out of spheres that have a smaller radius. So the power of a lens, if you think about how these two lenses bend light, this lens will bend light a little bit, but this lens will bend light a lot. A lens with a short focal length will bend light a lot. Right, which of these A or B have the larger power? Which of them has more power? Lens A or lens B? Remember our our power is the inverse of the focal point, or the focal length, 1 over f. So for which of those, can you turn this off? Which of those has the larger power? The one with the long focal point, 
are the shorter focal points. Okay, no. I want to know for which of these is P bigger. What has to happen to F for P to get bigger? Does it get bigger or does it get smaller? Right. So if F gets smaller, that means P gets bigger. So which of these has the larger power, A or B? A few more seconds. I'll stop at one minute. All right, B is right here. The one that uh, that bends light more has the higher power. So if since our power is 1 over F, if F decreases, that means our power increases. It's an inverse relationship. Uh, power is given in diopters. The unit is in diopters. You might have heard that from your optometrist. It's just inverse meters, I think. Or is it? In I think it's inverse meters. Where you're yeah, it's inverse meters. Where your focal length is in meters, and it's just the inverse of that. Okay? We'll pick back up with that on Tuesday. Actually, we'll have our quiz at the beginning on Tuesday, and um, we'll pick back up with that for a little bit. Can I get my pig back? Thank you. Well, have a great day, okay? Oh, shoot. I have your exams. If you want to stay a few minutes later, I can give them back to you. Or if you want to pick them up on Tuesday, that's fine, too. I'm very sorry. I'm at the finish early. <laughs>